Here at Doughty Street, we're very proud to have uh, a action against the police team that always, or well, certainly for the more than the last 10 years, gets ranked as the best uh, by Chambers Directory as a claimant's police team. And we're very pleased to have coming up a couple of seminars which are designed to help criminal practitioners identify cases in which, after a good result, they should be taking it further. Uh, my practice is mainly a criminal practice in trial, at trial level, appellate level, but I also have a regular stream of some civil actions that follows. Heather, uh, on the other hand, uh, is a specialist, the leader of our team, and a, a significant part of the reason why we always do so well in the rankings. Now, the two areas we'd like to talk about, just as a taster for the seminars, are the sort of actions that might happen after a criminal trial, and then there's also some things we want to think about before. Heather, what are we looking for in, uh, in an action after a trial? Well, two elements in particular, Joel. Uh, you're nearly always going to need to have an acquitted client and also a case where the evidence has indicated serious police misconduct, uh, which really goes to the heart of the evidence. And just unpicking those elements a little more. If you don't have an acquitted defendant, if your client has been convicted, however unjust, that may seem you really need to get that resolved first because, well there are a number of difficulties but the main one is that in civil proceedings um, the rule against collateral challenge will apply which means that you can't put forward, you can't base your case in the civil proceedings on a narrative that would um, be inconsistent with the chain of events the prosecution has established in securing the conviction. The second element that I spoke about, police misconduct, I mean it could take a number of forms, it might be fabricating or planting evidence, it might be coercion of witnesses, or deliberately uh, keeping back exculpatory material. But in most instances you're going to need something of that nature as opposed to pure incompetence uh, in police or prosecutor prosecutorial conduct in order to have a viable claim. So we're not just looking, are we, for a case where because the burden of proof is so high in criminal litigation, the jury can't be sure. We're looking for a case where you've actually managed to prove by whatever means that there's been police or perhaps even prosecutorial misconduct. Yes, or that you've got, um, you've seen enough of the evidence to have a realistic prospect of being able to prove that in due course. And it's not just trials, there's, there's also work to be done after appeals. And again, if you have an appeal against conviction where the Court of Appeal after umming and ahhing for a bit, just about think the judge got the law wrong, that's probably not going to be a good basis for damages. But if you have a case, I, I pick an example uh, that uh, myself and another member of the team worked on last year, where the Court of Appeal have branded a prosecutor's failure lamentable, uh, then you may be able to start thinking about suing for damages after a really successful appeal, where you've managed to get to the level of starting to prove the other side have done something very seriously wrong. What are the headings we're looking for? So the main causes of action that will come up in relation to claims against the police really fourfold. Firstly, assault and battery, for instances where the police have used excessive force, for example, uh, in effecting the arrest, and it may be the direct application of force, punching, throwing someone to the ground, or indirectly via police equipment such as tasers and CS gas. Uh, second uh, common cause of action is false imprisonment. Um, that relates to pre-charge detention only and in such circumstances the onus is on the police to establish a legal power uh, uh, under which they detained the person in question. Thirdly, malicious prosecution. You need to have the criminal proceedings have ended successfully for your client, whether uh, by way of a discontinuance or an acquittal on the merits, and you need to be able to show the prosecution was brought without reasonable and probable cause and maliciously. The latter means for an improper motive and therefore you need to be able to show bad faith on the part of uh, the police. And in complex cases where there are multi strands to the evidence relied on by the prosecution, it can often be a complex and difficult exercise to show who was the prosecutor for the purpose of malicious prosecution and therefore the personal persons who you need to show acted in bad faith. And fourthly, um, the other uh, cause of action, misfeasance in public office, which is similar, not identical, but very similar to the criminal offence uh, of uh, misconduct in public office. Um, useful where you can't establish all the ingredients of a malicious prosecution claim, but you have got evidence of officers acting in bad faith. And I think, let's stay with the bad faith for a moment, because a point that's 
is interesting, I think it's an interesting point to, to have in mind, is this. Very often, police will misbehave, or verbal people, or will even plant things, or prosecutors will take shortcuts, not comply with their duties, in, in what a police commissioner once called noble cause corruptions. But the fact that they think your client did it, put bluntly, uh, isn't the end of it, is it? That, that doesn't necessarily defeat malicious prosecution, because there can be an argument, there's no reasonable and probable cause, that they don't believe in their case, even if in their heart of hearts they think the defendant was guilty, and of course misfeasance gets past that as well. You don't need to have uh, someone they knew was innocent if they're misbehaving badly enough for that. What about negligence? That, that's, that's, that's a rare one, isn't it? It's a difficult one. It's one we're often asked about because it's very common for people to be on the adverse end of police or prosecutorial incompetence. In particular, they might have spent a lengthy period um, on uh, remand in custody only for the case against them to collapse at trial. But the appeal courts in civil claims have said repeatedly uh, that a duty of care, which is a foundation for a negligence claim, doesn't arise in most instances where police act uh, in the investigation and suppression of crime. And equally, a duty of care doesn't arise um, in respect of the Crown Prosecution Service's conduct towards a, um, a person who's been charged with a criminal offence. There are a few exceptions, for example, where uh, the police or prosecutor has specifically assumed a responsibility, but that has to be by way of conduct that's over and above the undertaking of their usual duties. Or in other instances where police have become involved in a situation and have um, specifically made it worse, as for example in contrast to preventing um, damage. And if that making it worse has actually occasioned the particular injury or loss that your client relies on, that can be another exception. But it's pretty limited. Um, there are also limited circumstances where police or prosecutorial incompetence has led to a person spending time in cust custody or longer time in custody than they otherwise would have done, that there may be a claim under um, Article 5 of the European Convention on Human Rights via the Human Rights Act, but that's a tricky one as well. Well, the other area we haven't really looked at, and I'll, I'll do it shortly because we don't want to spoil your appetite for the seminars that we'll come to in a moment, uh, is pretrial actions. And that's normally by way of judicial review. And the two obvious areas to think about uh, is in relation to search warrants. They can be challenged and damages will attach if they've been improperly obtained. And in some cases, um, the material seized can actually be uh, returned by order of the court uh, if the police have misbehaved or misled a judge in a search warrant. Uh, similarly, again, it's, it's probably rarer, but it happens where the Crown Prosecution Service refuse to prosecute someone, then there's the possibility initially of asking them to review, and if they get that wrong, then there's the possibility of a successful judicial review obliging them to actually prosecute. What about money? I mean, this is uh, all fine for our clients, but uh, lawyers have bills to pay. What's the sort of funding we people should be thinking about here? Well, the most um, desirable and the simplest, if um, uh, the, the client is in a position um, to do so, is to pay privately. But there are other options. A lot of um, claims against the police are litigated via conditional fee agreements, but those are not without um, potential cost risks to a client, so they have to be looked at carefully in each instance. There's also still um, civil legal aid available for quite a lot of areas of police um, uh, uh, litigation, particularly those involving deliberate misconduct, but there you have a stringent uh, means test to satisfy a difficult merits threshold uh, and the uh, firm in question will need to have a contract with the legal aid agency in order to be able to carry out that kind of work. Well, we've gone into a certain amount of detail, but obviously the idea of this we hope is to whet your appetite. We are running two seminars here in Chambers. They're on the 29th of March and the 27th of April. Please go on the website, have a look, see what we have lined up for you, uh, and that'll also tell you how to book uh, and the details of when they are and how to get here. And if you can't make it to the seminars, or you can make it to the seminars, in any event, we've got a large and experienced team of Actions Against the Police lawyers here, so please do get in contact uh, if you've got any questions or any areas you'd like to discuss with us. Thank you very much. We're here to help.